Welcome back to the DJ Sessions, where we feature the best DJs and producers from around the world. I'm your host, Darren, and right now I'm sitting in the virtual studios in Seattle, Washington, with none other than one of our resident DJs coming over from their bird's nest, not too far away from Seattle, Washington, just a wee bit outside. We have Avian Invasion in the house tonight. How are you doing tonight, Avian? Not too bad, not too bad. I just got back from a gig in Atlanta, so I'm still a little jet lagged. I saw that. I saw that. I caught a little of the performance on Twitter and definitely had to shoot out a heart emoji, whatever that's called. Like, what is that? I don't know what it's called on Twitter. They don't have a like button, but I uh, definitely saw you on the stage with the keytar. Oh, yeah. Gotta um, love this. This is my weapon of choice right here. <laughs> love this thing. I love that thing. You know, um, I guess the first question I want to ask that I want to get started with is um, you didn't always start in the electronic music world did you what what's your music background and how how did you get to avian invasion uh, well uh so I, i'm i'm something of an ancient creature so the story goes way way back eons ago in the 80s uh i was uh i was just a piano player i uh started taking piano lessons at age five and did the classical music thing until i got bored with that about 25 years later um <laughs> Uh, got a degree in music and started touring in Christian pop. Yeah, don't spread that around. Um, <laughs> I don't. In a former life, I did a lot of things I'm not entirely proud of. Um, I mean, I don't regret it, but it just sort of uh, is, is not for me. Uh, did the Nashville music scene for a while? Backed up Billy Currington at the Grand Ole Opry, you know that sort of thing. Um, played with a whole lot of cover bands and then just sort of got on board with the the podcasting boom in 2004 2005 and did the Ben Folds ish piano rock thing and eventually it just wasn't working there was something not right it, something wasn't feeding my soul and I felt like a broken man you know just standing on stage going through the motions and just getting nothing out of it and then the birds found me and rebuilt me one piece at a time and introduced me to thumping noises <laughs> and now i make thumping noises and i'm very happy with these thumping noises well we definitely love the thumping noises question is do you become a different person when you get on stage and do you become a different person when you get off stage i would have to say yes because I'm normally not uh, an attention-seeking narcissist uh, off stage, uh, but on stage you kind of have to be. You know, it's everybody look at me. So, uh, but it, it, uh, in all seriousness, like, like, n n kind of. I I try to be more positive when I'm performing. More of the the the, the plur mentality: peace, love, unity, respect. Or in my case, plurb, peace, love, unity, respect, bird. Um, we uh, we have shirts that say that now, and that was like it's amazing having a bad joke on a stream suddenly become part of your merchandising. But I digress. Uh, the vibe when I'm on stage, I try to be the most positive influence in everybody's life at that particular time because I get the feeling most people could use a little extra positivity in their lives right now you know that has definitely resonated throughout your performances and in your live streams uh, what is the what was the uh, um, motivation for including that or, or wanting to spread that message and make it uh, kind of a well it is kind of a prominent theme with a lot of your streams i mean you have the definite uh, the voices that come in, I know that's, that's, that's the bird's voice coming in. Is there a name or a character behind that voice that comes in? That's giving those positive vibe messages. Or are, is you, that are you talking about the, the giant robot voice, the giant robot voice? Well, the, the, the motto is you are alive. You are beautiful. You are not alone. And of course, free your mind. And that's something that I needed to tell myself, as I said, when I first got into the, uh, the thumping noises, when the birds had just rebuilt me, I was kind of broken. I was 
depressed. I didn't have a whole lot of hope for the future. All I could see was darkness. And those are three things that I needed to tell myself. And I realize I am absolutely not alone in needing that affirmation. You are alive because sometimes you can go through life just feeling numb as though like, it, I mean, am I really even here? Am I really even alive? I get up, I drink my Keurig piece of shit, I go to, go to work and I sit at a desk and nobody notices me and I get home and still nobody notices me, my wife, my husband, my kids, my dog doesn't even pay attention to me, whatever. You need to be reminded from time to time you are in fact alive. You are beautiful. That's something that not people don't hear often enough. Like, you know, you may not be, you may not look like what's on the magazine cover, the album cover, but you are in fact a beautiful creation. And most importantly, especially during the pandemic, you are not alone. As having, having been shoved into isolation as most of us have, it can be kind of hard to remember that there are people out there who love you and who want you in their lives. So those, those are three things that I try to project at every one of my shows. Even if I'm just up there DJing, I try to select music that is positive, you know, not, uh, I mean, th there's a time and a place for angry music and angry music is really, really fucking cool. But it's there's a time and a place for it and i i choose to try and project positivity i was heavily influenced by above and beyond group therapy because that was the first time i'd ever heard dance music that was punchy and energetic but still beautiful hmm. like absolutely like well orchestrated uh written more like a songwriter than a dance music producer you know what i mean uh and i i I really took a liking to that and it made me try and spread some positivity of my own every chance that I could. Yeah. I think that's one, when I hear that come in, it reminds me, I listened to a down tempo ambient radio station groove salad by some FM.com and they have big Earl that comes in every so often and, and has these little blurb, these messages about, you know, groove salad. And, and I've been listening to it for so many years that, I literally stop and pause when I hear big Earl come on. I'm like, Oh, that's big Earl. Okay, cool. And when I'm watching your sets and, and that, that messaging is coming through, you know, and it's not part of the track. It's, it's definitely prominent. It's, oh, there it is a message that gets out and, and, and it, it, it resonates. It, it definitely is kind of that mantra that you, that, that comes through with what you're doing. And it, it definitely comes through in your performance and, and everything you do. Um, I love that you uh, you listen to Groove Salad. Like um, again, a million years ago in like 2004, back when I was still human, I interviewed Derek Sivers for a podcast that I ran. Derek Sivers is the founder of CD Baby. Okay, uh, he, that was what he listened to. He's a big Groove Salad fan. Yeah, I, I, hands down. If it's not if it's not a Mackie shirt and it's not an Apple shirt. It's, it's a, a Soma, Soma shirt, FM. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Love those guys. Got to give a shout out to Rusty Hodge and the team over there. Um, and Now, did you go to school to learn how to produce music, or is this something you just picked up on your own, or did, did you come from a musical family? What's your background in, in, in music creation and where you got up to play an instrument? I was going to say, like, the answer to all that is sort of yes. <laughs> um, so like, I did come from a musical family. Uh uh, my parents were not professional musicians, but they played, they sang, you know, dad played the guitar, Mo mom played the auto harp. For those of you who uh, remember that piece from the, the sixties folk singer stuff. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I, I did in fact go to school for music and I got a, a composition, uh, major. So songwriting, not so much production. As a matter of fact, I never have, I've never taken any like formal, uh, engineering classes of any kind. All that has had, had to have been learned from listening to friends who are way better at it than I am. And I have been blessed with many, many friends who have been holding my little hands, walking me through this electronic music stuff. Um, and the, the best piece of advice I can give to anyone else who wants to get started is listen to people who know more than you do, because I've gotten great advice from them. Mm -hmm. um, 
but like I said, I, I I started out fresh out of college doing like Christian pop. It was me and a piano, and that was it. Striking out in the in a Ford Taurus across the uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, and eventually moving my way down to Nashville, where I realized this is not for me. Um, so like it 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 has been an interesting journey throughout multiple genres, but there is a bedrock of formal training that I absolutely recommend to anyone who wants to get into uh, making music because, uh, or even DJing because having a solid grasp of music theory is absolutely essential for doing some more creative transitions and, uh, 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 you know, curation. Uh, It's funny you bring that up music theory. Uh, I was just going to ask one of my next questions was should DJs learn music theory or does it really matter that much when it comes to dance music? Yes, yes, yes. And again, yes. You know, if, if you learn nothing more than the circle of fifths, you know, or the, the Camelot wheel, they are in fact the same thing, but if you learn nothing more than the circle of fifths, then at, at least you've got some kind of foundation, but it, it does actually help having a handle on basic mixing or basic orchestration um you know music music theory when you are serving up music you know is i wouldn't say it's absolutely essential there's always going to be exceptions out there who can just just do it all by ear intuitively but you know like having having a little bit of book learning under your belt will certainly help you as a dj absolutely as a producer but you know, even as a DJ, even if, even if all you're doing is lining up the banging noises so that they, they line up with each other and then crossing over from one to the other, like, you know, you, you should have that knowledge under your belt. And now I know you're in the bird's nest right now. And my next question coming up was, and you use multiple pieces of gear or you have in the past. Oh boy, do I. Does gear really matter when being creative or should an artist just be able to go with anything to, to all their fans? Uh, what matters when being creative is being comfortable, you know, not having to fight the equipment, like having a good handle on what it is you're using on the flip side of that, playing around with something brand new that you don't really understand yet. You, you, you know, you'll, you'll mess up in, in fun and interesting ways, ways that you might actually want to keep later. So it's it, there's a little of both in there, but but as far as the the equipment goes, like most of the fans don't care if you're using hardware synths or software synths. You know, most fans will will not even be able to tell the difference at the end of the day. As a matter of fact, if all you use are presets, you know, I mean, listen to Stefan Bods and all he's really doing is using a sine wave, and that's it. Like a sine wave and a nine oh nine, and and he's amazing. You know like with with everything that that he makes uh him and romboy so like uh, you you can be very minimalist in your uh your your arsenal but what matters is what are you trying to say with that arsenal you know absolutely and 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 so obviously you're in your studio right now the it is the bird's nest the, the new and improved <laughs> bird's nest no 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 no. this isn't the oh, new and improved this one is the yet. new and improved no 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 i still need shingles on the new one <laughs> shingles on the new one but over to your left isn't there a repository of liquor right there <laughs> yeah we've got uh so uh i stream three days a week on yep. twitch at avianinvasion.com slash live. Bam! Okay, <laughs> sorry. I had to work that in there. Um, and every time a hype train starts on Twitch, I take an engine shot, which means I just <laughs> pour myself a little shot at the beginning. And if we make it past level five, I take a caboose shot. Well, little when I started doing that, little did I realize that my fans would send me like two level five hype trains every single show. Last night, they sent me four of them. So wait, is my, that twenty shots? Uh, no, no, no. So uh, it's every hour on the hour. So that was two, four, six, eight, eight shots. Okay. But I also went off script a couple of times because they were also <laughs> hitting the tip jar with a freaking sledgehammer. Uh, on my birthday, I did an eight-hour-long stream, and little did I realize they had gotten together, pre-planned, and sent me 
at least a dozen, I could keep going, but I'm running out of space to face these here, at least a dozen bottles of sake from yeah. all over. So, like, I mean, there's more on the floor down here, but I, I won't pick them up. Like, literally, I have like 30 <laughs> bottles of interesting things that people send me for the hype train shots. So, <laughs> like, I, I swear to God, I'm not an alcoholic. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I had started doing this with whiskey. I started, I had like whiskey and rum and scotch up here. And then when I realized like these people are going to make me take like two or three shots an hour, every single time I'm playing, I should get something that's more like 12% alcohol, not 40, you know, or, or whatever. Ugh. However, it yeah. has been an, an amazing journey through interesting flavors because sake comes in all shapes, sizes, colors, and levels of cloudiness. I, I found that out a long time ago. I, I knew it wasn't just the hot sake anymore with the yeah. restaurants. And then I started going to higher end sushi restaurants. And then uh, now I have an H Mart and they have a whole aisle full of sake. Oh, H Mart. Oh, a block yes. and a half from my place. And sashimi grade fish. And sashimi grade Ooh. fish. Yes. It is, uh, speaking it is my an language. awesome, tempting store to go to from time to time. <laughs> and, um, but uh, you're, yeah, you, you have your streaming studio, uh, your show. Uh, you have multiple shows per week that you go live. I believe it's is it still it's Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Tell us about those shows. Okay, um, and what time is they going at? Well, Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm on at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Obviously, here in here in the Emerald City. Sorry, hang on. There we go. Here in the Emerald City. <laughs> um, but uh, Mondays, it's Trance Invasion, and obviously, it's uh, mostly a trance show. Obviously, some progressive will sneak into any given trance show because they're kind of there's a Venn diagram of compatibility there. But for the trance lovers, uh, I'm also now a resident DJ with Trance Family Canada, so I'll be streaming uh, Mondays at 3 p.m. on their channel once every four weeks. So you can just follow me at avianinvasion.com slash live for that. Uh, Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Pacific time, I do the Progressive Birdhouse, which is obviously Progressive House, uh, a little bit of trance, melodic house and techno, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it, that, that's more my main jam. That's that's what really drives me. I love Progressive because it's such a diverse, uh, it, 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 it's such a, a, a broad genre, you know. Everything from Dead Mouse to Boris Brejka to uh, uh, to you know D uh, DJ Anna uh, and Miss uh, Miss Monique, like all these amazing different tastes. Like Camilo San Clemente has become one of my big favorites too. Mm -hmm. uh, all these different flavors all fall under one genre, and it all works pretty well together. Um, and then on Fridays at eight a.m. Pacific time. I get my ass out of bed, make some, make some coffee, and do the early bird breakfast, which is a couple hours of deep house, an organic house. Uh, no talking. A little bit of whispering here and there, but that's it. But no talking, so you can actually put this on while you're at your day job. And uh, <laughs> if a hype train starts, then you can watch me do Irish cream shots in my coffee before breakfast. I have literally jumped out of, been in bed, do my morning ritual, <laughs> realized you're live, jumped out of bed, ran to the computer and put you on and listened to those shows. Yeah, I, it's, I, it's like the thing to wake up to. I love it. I'm, I'm very glad to hear you say that because the more people say that to me, it justifies why I bother getting up early. I mean, I'm a musician. <laughs> I don't normally... I'm not even I'm not even normally out of bed until like 8:30. So being ready to start performing by 8 is it's different. Well, I mean, you you are well dressed for it. You dress the part. <laughs> Always get the uh, the bathrobe. The bathrobe on, is you know. on. It's there. It's amazing. Um now you also don't only just stream. Um well, you know, I'm thinking what should I go into next? I, I want to talk with you about the other stuff you do outside of the studio, but you're in the studio now and I want to know what are you working on right now? Can you give uh, us a little sample of something you're working on right now? I can definitely do that. Um, I, I'm working on a new album, something okay. that I want to sound uh, uniquely me. And that's a journey that's difficult for a musician, for a producer, because it's so easy, when, especially when you're just getting into creating music, to listen to the people that you like and try and do what they're doing. 
but finding your own voice will always make you stand out uh, among all the other people that are just trying to sound like above and beyond or something like that. Uh, and also, you will be more satisfied with your work if it is uniquely you. So mm -hmm. I've been trying to hone that. And uh, I think I'm going in the right direction. This is actually something that has only been released to my Patreon fans uh, so far. Uh, my Officers Club. Uh, I'll play you just a little snippet of it, but this is something called Into the Trees. Let me back it up a little bit so you get some kind of an intro here. Ah, there we go. a little snippet there i don't know if you want me to keep going or not but <laughs> no that was great that was great i mean that was awesome don't get don't give them all the candy make them buy the song right yeah, oh yeah all right that works don't i mean the they bowl. can say so you want more where can where can they find that you know? uh, well you can actually grab that like before the album comes out at uh, avianinvasion.com slash patreon uh i do release everything that's the beautiful thing about patreon and and kofi uh, I can release things literally like years before they actually get released to the public and my supporters there give me feedback and tell me, you know, this would probably work better if you did this. It's like I have, I have board members. They're like the crew on a pirate ship. And, and, and you do use Twitch. You mentioned Patreon, but you use Twitch as your main primary platform to stream from and how has that been working with a, pl a platform like Twitch that allows for a compensation model built into it with the bits, the subscriptions? And then you also have, I mean, you go down the line, you have Twitch going on, you have Patreon going on, you have PayPal going on, you know? I mean, I, I absolutely did not expect Twitch to be as much of a, uh, a part of my life as I did. As a matter of fact, I used to stream exclusively through YouTube and then YouTube started sucking and i i don't know how but like i try to stay positive but they've become absolute trash for music streaming uh, it got to the point now where i i try to uh, simulcast to youtube and the stream will get cut off because they detect copyrighted material the thing is the video stays online the video stays on youtube forever they have no problem with it but they will stop a live stream and I actually even got a copyright strike and I tried to appeal. I'm like, but the, the, the video is right here. You have no problem with the video. It says right here, like, like, you know, copyright claim, but it's still public. You have, and I'm not trying to monetize this video. You have absolutely no problem with this content. Why do I have a copyright strike for live streaming it? And their response was, nope, you're, you're violating, you're a violator. You're a filthy, filthy violator and you should feel bad about yourself. I mean, okay, I'm paraphrasing a little, but uh, yeah, YouTube has become openly hostile to uh, people in my line of work, whereas Twitch seems to be okay with it for now. You, you, we'll see you really want to go down that rabbit hole and be on this <laughs> yes. conversation? Yeah, right. Uh, I mean, like, I, how much time do you have? Yeah, but, uh, right. No, seriously, uh, like, like, I know that it's not, that is not going to last forever. 
uh, or maybe they'll find some way to license things, you know, do a content matching system and actually enforce it more uh, consistently than YouTube does. Uh, but until then, I, I absolutely did not expect Twitch to become such a huge thing. And especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was stuck at home and couldn't go out to concerts and whatnot, I didn't realize how much people needed to see shows like this and not just like watch shows, but interact. That's the biggest thing for me. Like I can't, I can't play to a dead audience and I hate just like streaming, like just here I am, watch me. Thank you. And good night. I, I, this is why I tour. This is why I carry heavy bags onto Southwest airlines flights and haul them all around the country. Uh, even though it'd be way easier to just sit and sit in my studio and stream the interaction, that energy reactor that is created when you are in front of a live audience, I'm feeding them all the energy I got and they send it right back at me with interest and it just goes back and forth. Twitch is the closest thing I've ever seen to that level of interactivity between performer and audience. It's almost like they're as much the star as, uh, as I am up here behind these, these two little wheels. Uh, I I can and, and totally, it's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, it's a lot like dance music itself. One of the, the big changes that I made from, you know, doing the, the piano rock thing into dance music, it was a big change for me as a rock star, you know, as a, a, a rock performer, or a singer, songwriter. You're on stage and all the lights are on you. Everybody look at me. I'm the hero here. But in a dance club, Usually the DJ's not even lit up all that much. They might have a big wall behind them, but the lights are all on the people. The lights are there to highlight the people dancing, not the idiot up here making thumping noises. These folks having a good time. They are the focus in dance music. And I think that's beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, it takes, it, it helps temper that aforementioned narcissism that, you know, I have. So it's it's rather nice and it's the same thing with twitch like the people in the chat are as much a part of the show as i am up here you know it, it brings me back to that original interaction coming from a a, 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 a a public access television world there was no way to interact with your viewers and i started in 92 doing public access and, and got into broadcast television in 2000 2001 and one of the things I wanted with my first show, Phantasmagoria, was to have a website, but have a chat room on the website that when our show aired on broadcast television, you could chat with us and be in the producer's room while the show was airing and have that live interaction. Like, oh, that's Here's neat. I was kind of like, I made this up. Like, I don't know yeah. anyone that would ever say, oh, we have a show on broadcast television on TV and you can chat with them in the chat room live. Well, it's going so yeah, in the, the 90s, that was unheard of. Yeah. Set the way clock forward to, you know, 2009 when I started looking at live streaming. I mean, this is after podcasting. Podcasting was a recorded show. So it was you could download it whenever you wanted, as opposed to broadcast television. It was on that on that set time. And then it was never there again. But um, when I started exploring Ustream and live stream as platforms, um, I liked the opportunity, that, or the ability that I could do a live streaming DJ set. And there's a chat room right there that people can interact with. In the, and they go, boom, you just drop. I mean, you, you know, boom. And just, you know, and seeing those reactions, you knew people were watching, listening. And, and, and that felt like you said, that energy was now reciprocated from the screen back to us in the studio, Always knowing that something was going on. It, it gets, I, I forgot to mention this, by the way, like you, you say, like, like it's not it, 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 the interactivity there. Um, it's not just uh, uh, like you're either interacting in an audience or you're interacting on Twitch. Uh, again, like the show that I played in Texas uh, several weeks ago, the show that I just played in Atlanta on Saturday, the convention that I was playing for live streamed on their channel and a subset of my fan base, they call themselves the chaos crew went into my channel, which I was not streaming on and started a friggin' hype train in there. 
<laughs> they started throwing throwing bits and subscriptions around, and I saw people in the front on the dance floor just behind the CO2 blasters waving their phones at me, showing me, and I could, I could see the little purple line on top. I'm like, holy shit, are they throwing money at me on Twitch right now, even though I'm, I'm here in Atlanta and I'm not even on my channel? The level of interaction crosses over there, too. The people at home were so, interacting with the live show on a big stage down down in a so real, wait, like, you, actual you, convention. Were you co-hosting the show? No, nope, they just went into my chat and just, you can start a hype train when the channel's <laughs> offline, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so... And we did at, in, in when this happened in Texas, w the AV guy, a uh, guy who goes by the name of Mad Dog, uh, brought me out uh, a, a caboose shot on the stage, just like he's a fan of the show and he's seen it before. He just like poured me some tequila and brought out a little plastic cup for me. I'm like, all right, oh I drink level five. <laughs> Yeah, that is so awesome! Oh my god, I couldn't believe it when it happened. I'm like, you people are insane. So, and you just got back from where was that again? Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta. which was a long Atlanta. flight. Yeah, and and you mentioned you were at a shows before. Now you tour, you go on tour, you you play. I mean, you've been going to a number of places. I keep seeing it pop up on the socials over and over and over again. What has been? How many places have you been to this year alone? Oh God! Uh, well, see, this year not so much. Uh, I I hit the um, uh, I, I mostly hit nerd conventions because Space Bird, you know, <laughs> it's hard to go wrong. Also, they're my people. Um, well, let's see here. Uh, I was going to hit San Jose. That convention got canceled because that was right when Omicron, you know, okay. did its thing. The the post Christmas uh, uh, clusterfuck. Um. Uh, after that, uh, th there actually have not been that many this year. Okay. Uh, I think it was that and then Texas and then Atlanta. I'm going to Reno in a couple of weeks. Last year, however, when conventions were suddenly allowed again, starting in about uh, the beginning of August, my little uh, business partner, Mythomorph, and I, uh, she's the one who makes my shirts and stuff. We hit a convention every two weeks for like the rest of the year that's every six yeah. you know every, every two weeks for like six months yeah so you get home you take a day off you unpack your stuff you have about four days and then you have to repack it all again and head back out which is why my new studio is not built yet <clears throat> But and, yeah, and they, we uh, we hit uh, uh, Reno, Denver, uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, Chicago. Well, Rosemont, but Chicago. Um, geez, where else? Uh, uh, Detroit, Minneapolis. I mean, like we were we were just basically racking up a million Southwest miles together, going going and uh, just playing shows and making T-shirts. Have you ever gotten scared when playing an event? Scared? How are you talking about like, like performance anxiety? Um, yeah, I guess stage fright, performance anxiety, like, like, Oh my gosh, I didn't know this crowd was going to be so huge. Uh, or, Oh my God, somebody's jumping up on stage and I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, most of the shows that I play, um, I mean, before COVID, most of the shows I play, it's accepted that people can jump up on stage. Okay. That kind of scares me because I also run around with a guitar, and so I kind of have to, like, sidle my way through the crowd to get down to the front of the stage sometimes. Um, but I, I actually get nervous before every one of the big shows. Anytime I'm on a big stage, like, this is the only place, like, this in the back of your truck are pretty much the only places I'm just, like, like, like a duck in water, you know? Um, before getting on to a big stage, I'm always a little nervous because there's always like, is my, my technological setup going to function properly? Um, like I opened for, for Essinger, uh, on Saturday and, uh, my show went off without a hitch. I mean, my crappy guitar playing and bad singing, notwithstanding, like technologically it went off without a hitch. His setup actually died sometime in the middle of his set. He was just like singing along all of a sudden, bam, silence. Like, and I felt so bad because I was, I was watching. I'm like, yep, been there, been there. I mean, he handled it like a professional. He just like got his shit started again. Like, 
all right, we're good. Sorry, guys. And just moved on. Just, you know, like, whatever. Um, but like that always terrifies me because it's what I do is highly technological. There's wireless body packs. There's, I have to make sure all the parts inside my head are functioning properly. Uh, the keytar it has to, has to be able to speak wirelessly to my stuff so I can run around on stage. There's a lot that can go wrong, uh, with the stage shows that terrifies me every single time I get on stage. Thankfully, uh, usually the venues have, you know, CDJs. So if everything turns to shit, I can still plug in a thumb drive and just be a DJ, <laughs> which is like the lowest bar for me. You know, just, just DJing is like, that's the fallback position. Well, are you saying that you're better than DJs? <laughs> no, I'm saying <laughs> that I give, I'm, I'm a, such a bad DJ that I have to do other shit to be impressive. <laughs> That's the way it really is. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not joking. Just, I feel so self-conscious about my actual DJing skills that like, yeah, no, I have to do a whole bunch of other crap to, to like detract from the fact that I'm just, I'm kind of an okay DJ. So I'm going on all these tours. Uh, obviously people are booking you to come and play the shows. This is a self-funded tour, which is awesome. It's always good to hear that artists are getting booked again and getting out there. What's the craziest way somebody's ever tried to pay you? Would, would, would you take Bitcoin, NFTs, <laughs> birdseed? Oh, you could pay me in fish. Uh, I've fish. been, I've legitimately, I used to do, um, so the convention I just played, usually when I do a convention show, the staff doesn't get to see my show because they're busy being staff, you know, like the AV crew gets to see my show, but like the uh, the the head of registration you know the the chairman ceo whatever of the convention like they rarely maybe they'll be able to like pop their head in for a couple of minutes so back in the day the staff of that convention used to fly me out for a house party six months offset from the convention we used to call it fish con back we're going we're coming full circle by the way because we would go to h mart down in uh, like suwanee or you know whatever the suburb of atlanta is uh, we would go to H Mart, pick up a stack of sashimi grade fish, and spend the entire morning making hand making sushi that would literally like you see this countertop in front of me here that I have set up for the uh, the DJ stuff literally just mounded over a kitchen table that big, and it was the entire staff and board of the convention, and I would just like perform i you know gorge myself on salmon and then perform you know burping salmon the whole time they didn't seem to mind uh so yeah i've actually i've basically been paid in fish to do uh <laughs> to do shows before that's awesome and i probably will again i hope <laughs> awesome um so you produce your own tracks do you run your own label then or do you produce and submit to other labels how how are you uh a little of both you, a little both. So, I mean, the, the difference, between, like all a record label is, is just a marketing department. And it's a marketing department that you are expected to sign the rights to your intellectual property over to when really all, all you need from a record label is uh, prestige and connections. Those are the only two things a record label can offer you as an artist. So I still submit things to record labels. As a matter of fact, I've been signed to Blanco y Negro, um, uh, House Party, Bass Rebels Records. If you haven't seen Bass Rebels Records, by the way, they are amazing. Danny works his ass off promoting his artists, and I cannot recommend that label enough. If you're a streamer, all the stuff that they put out is... Uh, is royalty free. You know, they, they, they won't, you won't get copyright strikes for playing bass rebel stuff. So you can actually find tracks from me like carnival of animals, um, uncharted skies, you know, uh, uh, choose your weapon. I have a few that I've actually signed to bass rebels, but I also have a whole lot that I've self released because if the labels are passing it over, like I know this is good material. Uh, I know that this is uh, usually good material. Uh, <laughs> Not everything I put out is a winner. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be upfront about that right now. But you know, you can always listen to it on Spotify first. Um, but the 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 you know uh, all the record all you're expecting from a record label is that they will have a greater reach than you do, which is why like I don't bother 
approaching record labels that have like fewer Twitter followers than I do because I'm like, you know, or like fewer people on Facebook. I've had record labels approach me like, hey, we'd like to sign some of your stuff on uh, label radar. And I look at their their socials. I'm like, I have a bigger reach than you do. And it's not a no. It's show me what your marketing plan is to promote the, what this track that you want to sign. And usually that ends the conversation because they don't have a plan. Their plan is to, well, we're just going to put it out on our socials and then own your work. So, I mean, I, I would recommend for an artist, uh, an up and coming artist to submit things to labels appropriately. You know, don't just shotgun it everywhere. Just pick one label, send it there. If they, they don't want it, then send it to another one. But like, make sure that you're sending stuff that actually jives with the sound of that label. But don't be discouraged if it doesn't get picked up because you can always self-release tracks and promote it yourself. Which you kind of should be doing anyway. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, like uh, you, you have to be, you have to be uh, as much into marketing uh, as you are into making the music and you have to be competent at both in order to survive as an indie artist. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's an unfortunate reality, but uh, if I could find a record label that would regularly release my tracks and had competent marketing and could help expand my reach, I would absolutely prefer that because it's, I don't want to, I didn't get into music to be a marketing person. I didn't get into music to be a tech person. I got into music so that I could make thumping noises and be the center of attention, you know, and that's, that's, that's the ultimate goal here is to get on stage in front of people and go, hello, fill in the blank city and have them all go. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Knowing what you know now, would you go back? Would you, if you had two choices, you could go back 25 years in music history or forward 50 years in music future, which one would you pick and why? And you're, definitely... so you're the same age, you're the same uh, age that you are now. Oh, okay. So I like, I'm, I'm still going to be a thousand years old, even if I go back in time. Correct. Okay. Um, I, I probably would go back in time just because knowing what I know now, I could stay in front of the trends, you know, <laughs> get a leg up. <laughs> That kind of thing. I could release Sandstorm 25 years ago. Oh, shit. Did that come out 25 years ago? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, the anniversary, I think, just came out. I'm going to go cry now. I, I, I literally <laughs> think the anniversary of Sandstorm was 25 years ago. I will, uh... you, know, you know what's funny about that is that um, actually... Um, Darude is the as uh, the one DJ that is actually out of town celebrity DJ that has appeared on the DJ sessions the most. Nice, very yeah, he's nice. He's been on the show like four or five times. Um, no, it was okay. So apparently, apparently, it was released in two thousand. Okay, so twenty two years ago. All right, so I could just like barely make it in front of that one. Yeah, the first. Root Sandstorm just turned twenty. That was in two thousand nineteen. It actually was released in ninety nine. I remember hearing it in ninety nine. Yeah, like I remember hearing it uh, uh, back in back in the nineties. I remember the first time I heard that song. I was in a club. I remember the club, and it was insane. Um, that was a fun time. Um, speaking of that, though, and um, um. Tracks being released. Yes. Releasing. I just realized that uh, I play, I play Oculus and uh, I have an Oculus and, you know, we have our VR nightclubs for, for the DJ sessions. But one of the things I love in Oculus is they have a game called beat saber. Yes. And they just released the uh, electronic music pack, the latest electronic music pack and sandstorm was one of them. Now I'm damn good at this game on normal and I can play a lot of levels on hard, but I've never used the word fuck. More than I have with that <laughs> Oculus on when I tried Sandstorm on normal on Beat Saber. So you, you and Beat Saber, me and Mario Kart. Yeah. I've, oh. I've invented some obscenities. My usual positive vibe just goes right out the window when I'm playing Mario Kart, I assure I, you. I literally, it's the first time I ever had to actually take the Oculus. So I was like, I'm not playing this anymore. And it, was sand, it was Sandstorm on normal, <laughs> not easy, normal, not hard. hard. Yeah, not very yeah. hard, not experts, just the normal version of it. And I'm like, this is, this is way too, this is, this is not normal. Normal's like 300, a, 320 notes. This is like 480, 500. I had a good, uh, a very good friend who, uh, unfortunately we lost during COVID, 
uh, who Beat Saber was his workout regimen. Yeah, because like he had a you know a little little apartment in downtown Seattle, so it's not exactly like you 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 don't go jogging in downtown Seattle and unless you like needles. Um, <laughs> the, or you come to my corner, third and crime. Yeah, right, exactly. But uh, he used to he used to stream Beat Saber stuff, and uh, the 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 piece de resistance for him was Dragon Force, uh, you know, Fire in the Flame, you know. Which is like it's it's this manically paced uh, uh, geek metal song that's like look it up it's it's definitely not dance music because I don't know who could dance to this but like I can't imagine him flailing around you know like Yikes. he must have he must have just like sweated about fifteen pounds working through that one I'm like you got more stamina than I do my Three, friend three hundred calories every thirty minutes pretty much no that's, joke that's what it is and that, here I am that's standing like normal, and drinking that's like beer. just normal pace if you put it on hard or expert mode oh wow yeah Beat Saber is pretty awesome um, oh, I'm also yeah. working with another one called Synth Riders though which is kind of heard of that cooler it's it's actually there's a lot more tracks. I, I feel the libraries out there a little more. It was a little bit easier to side quest. And now we're getting kind of sidestepped outside of the interview talking about VR. Yeah, Let's I was going to say. Bring it back in. The VR. <laughs> we just going to talk about video games now? Yeah, totally talk about video games now. But uh, about VR is that, um, you know, of, of course, the DJ sessions have, we have our nightclubs in VR. We can't wait to start launching those. But you're getting into VR. And tell us about your initial experience of, of what that's looking like and what the future of VR is going to look like for Avian Invasion. Well, so the thing is, I'm used to the past of VR, which is Second Life. <laughs> there was a time when I did shows. I did shows opening up for Coca-Cola when they started a world, for Playboy when they started a world. Um, I, I, I basically did a, a, a whole lot of piano vocal performances in Second Life back when that was the hot item in like 2005-ish, 2007-ish, something like that. And it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, I'm not kidding. Like, it's... The technology, the rendering is better. The interface technology, now that the promise of virtual reality that we were given in the 90s, you know, the, the lawnmower man experience is so much better now and so much like more realistic, so much more immersive now. Uh, I am very much looking forward to actually DJing in virtual space, not streaming a Twitch screen somewhere into a virtual space, but actually having an avatar there and being the bird in uh, in the actual chat it's too bad i couldn't get the obs camera thing working for this interview because i could actually fly in a picture of my avatar that i've got that uh, again mythomorph uh made for me because she she anticipated me uh, getting involved in virtual like long before i ever actually got around to it but it it looks like especially during the continuation of covid it looks like an amazing place to play and it's an interesting way to tour and see a live crowd in front of you and even interact with them. Like when you're done with your set, you can go down onto the dance floor and just hang out with people and talk like you would at a club. Like it's actually pretty fantastic. Um, as with most virtual spaces, the furries were there first and will be for the, uh, you know, for every single platform. So uh, the avatars are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, bird person here will absolutely fit in with that, I hope. But uh, last night, they uh, uh, the Chaos crew struck again and basically threw enough money at me to get a proper graphics card finally. And I've almost raised enough to throw like a Valve Index or something on top of that. So I will hopefully be DJing in virtual space soon. And I know you're setting up some virtual spaces and hopefully we can do more than just stream a uh, Twitch stream into there. Hopefully I can actually be there in 3D in, uh, uh, in one of your clubs. We're definitely working on that. It, we're, I was just in a conversation with somebody from LA today for four hours, almost four and a half hours and giving them kind of the layout because they came to me, called me out of the blue and said, Hey, I got approached by this company that does this VR thing. What do you know about that? And I go, let's go down the rabbit hole. 
<laughs> in and some cases, the literal rabbit hole. And the moment I, sh- I said, go to my website, first I said, go to the website, go to the DJ sessions.com forward slash VR, check this out. And he goes, bro, whoa, bro, whoa, whoa, you're, this is what your night, this is, these aren't conceptual designs. These are what your nightclubs look like. I said, yes, wait till you go get an Oculus, best $300 you'll ever spend. I'll take you on a tour of the club. Then I'll take you to some other places in VR to show you what version, because that's just beta nightclub that's sitting there. This isn't even version one yet. And then what we got planned for version two and what's going to happen in version three, where it's it's going to be next the next level. And that's where we're going to start doing the stuff that you're talking about, where we'll be able to bring your full, not an avatar, your real body character person into vr i mean somebody could go up and count the, the the lights on your on your head and say one two three i mean and see them and, and be able to walk around behind you and and be like oh you're wearing oh okay that's cool and and then come around that if sounds we a little creepy to actually <laughs> what <laughs> that sounds a little creepy like i'm just sitting there djing just like people just yeah, they could just cut. Yeah, literally, they could come right up behind you and be like, "Oh, let me, let me get." We could block off certain areas of the stage that could get up there, but it would. Oh yeah, I know you could set up barriers there, and stuff there, like that. There's but. been some tricks that people have used in VR that we've seen where they they'll they'll use OBS and they'll put a green screen up so it'll be clear behind them, so it does look like it's them, but it's a 2D image of them. I'm talking about a full 3D yeah rendering that's not an avatar; it's the actual person. But I know the guy who's developing the technology for that. We've talked to them. Uh, we're on some next level five year, 10 year yeah, rollouts on this stuff. That sounds pretty like I, I can conceptualize the technology involved in making that happen. And it's definitely in the realm of, of possibility, not too expensively, but like, I mean, for the, the hardware involved. But as far as that, like, I've never seen that as an actual product yet because that, like, basically, like, scanning from multiple multiple angles and then having to quickly like render that into a, an avatar of sorts like that sounds that sounds fascinating i can't yeah, wait to see pro- where that the goes problem, the problem is is the platforms yeah. you know horizon is you aren't gonna be able to do this in horizon vr chat uh rec room alt space solar whatever any of those it, it has to be it's almost standalone application bill it, it's not it's not it's not like everyone's just gonna be able to walk out and do this yeah, you know, but I mean, like, it, it, what a time to be alive, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, fuck COVID and you know, uh, fuck fascists, but the the rest of it, like, and, and, and like, I, I I can't fathom what it must have been like trying to be a successful musician in like the 1700s. You basically have to suck up to one rich guy and hope that he doesn't tire of you, like the kind of technology, the kind of liberating technology that lets me show up to a gig in a club with just a thumb drive and I can get more complicated from there if I want to, but literally all I have to do is walk into the club and go, I'm ready. It's absolutely astounding. And now virtual space, uh, uh, you know, is, is making, is taking that to a whole other level. I cannot wait to see what the future brings. I am so, so excited about where this is all going. I, I think I've, I've actually, I'm working on getting our first two um, honorary resident DJs that are outside of our hometown of Seattle to come on board and do exclusive shows, weekly shows in the VR nightclubs and have a residency in the VR nightclubs. We're expanding that, that and opening that up and, and making that happen. And uh, yeah, it's, I think, one of the things you said about what the DJ sessions does, it's not a label, but uh, what a, what a record label does is they're in charge of the marketing and promotions of something. And that's what the DJ sessions does is, you know, you have your show and your brand and we'll be putting that in there three times a week. You know, your shows will be in the club. You are one of the first residents in the virtual reality clubs that we have both beta and entry. And we will be launching to other platforms as well. Um, but we will look at other artists from around the world and there will be a certain caliber that will, that will hold the standard to, it isn't just like any, anyone can just come and play the DJ sessions nightclub. You know, we, we want to make sure those residencies are, are solid DJs that can, can that was, live up to the caliber of what we're looking for. So, yeah. um, the, by, everyone's going to get excited. And I tell people right now, you know, 12 years ago, I was pitching the idea of live streaming DJs. And everyone's like, oh, what's this? Who's going to want to stay at home? Who's going to do this? 
two years ago, everybody in the world just suddenly, online. yeah, exactly. They all flocked days. to Twitch. And now I'm telling people, I, I kind of paused. And last year, I, I got my first headset and I started making a shift and going, if, if I come up to somebody right now and they are not talking to me about VR and they're an artist and doing something in the VR realm, I'm kind of like, say, Levy, you're, you're, you're using something that is 10, 15 years old and you're just getting into it now, you're already behind the A ball. And if you're not getting into VR, by the time it hits, you're going to try to get in and you're going to try to develop it where everyone's five years ahead of you and have that built in audience, their built in world, and they're, they're, they have spent the investment, the time, and the money to build something up. And you're going to be starting with the building, the, the, uh, the, what's the, what's the basic blocks of Legos that the little kids play with? The big oh, ones. Uh, Duplo or whatever. Duplo, the, yeah, yeah. Duplo blocks. <laughs> I was going to say try Minecraft. Duplo but... this shit. And everyone's going to be building the Death Star, you know? And they're going to be having concerts and like people are going to be flocking. This is like getting involved with the web and getting a website back in 1995 or 96 or 97, be able to put the information up there that people could go to a computer and find out about you. They didn't have to go to the venue. They didn't have to get a newspaper. They didn't have to turn on the TV and it was there 24 yeah, seven. Yeah. I mean, the, you, the, 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 you know all about this. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the, the accessibility for indie, independent artists, if you are willing to uh, become more of an entrepreneur and less of just an artist, and that's, I think that's the hardest thing. When I, when I play shows at conventions, I also lead panels uh, during the daytime on how to turn your art into a business. And basically, you have all these people who, like, I draw or I make costumes uh, or I'm an author or I'm a musician, and they don't realize just how many different hats you have to wear. In some cases, some, for some of us, an entirely different face you have to wear. Uh, but, like, the the... The, the number of responsibilities that you have to take on and you have to you have to, to be your own marketing person, your own d graphic designer, unless you have a ton of money and you can hire these things out. You have to do all this stuff yourself and also keep your finger on the pulse of where all this stuff is going and understand what is what you want to do. Like, do, like what what do you what is your goal what, as a as a as an artist? and see the the various things on the horizon and be able to spot like that one meshes with where I want to go. I'm going to focus on that and just sort of hope you're right. It's like surfing. You never know which one of those waves is actually going to be the good one, yep. but you got to get in front of it regardless. Yep. Whether or not it's actually going to, you're going to have a, a sweet curl all the way to the shore. Well, that remains to be seen, but if you're not in front of that wave, it doesn't, it, 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 it could fail or it could be beautiful and you're not going to be there. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. It's so hard to do that though. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, you got, you got to kind of pick and choose. And I, I personally being in the, it, where I wanted to be as the executive producer, you know, starting in public access. And then the natural progression was to go to broadcast television. And then when the internet came out and we missed the YouTube window, but podcasting came out, and then the next evolution of that was live streaming. And the next evolution there, of what's the next field is VR and AR is going to come after that, you know? So um, these are on the horizon. These are on the, the, you know, companies like Facebook. I was talking with one of the lead developers for Project Aria a few weeks back. And she's like, we plan this stuff 15 years out. And if you're not thinking that way in this game, like I'm just a DJ, I want to play in a club. I've heard it time and time before from very successful DJs that grind what you just described. You have to wear all those hats. You have to do this. If you think I'm just going to show up at the club and put my flash drive in and I'm going to get a big success. Well, there's a million of those people out there. 10 yeah, million that of those was, people out there. That and, was the hardest thing when I was working the Nashville scene is like, I'm male singer songwriter, number 8,742 of 20 million, yeah. you know, <laughs> like there's the, the, the ability to set yourself apart. And I'm very glad that when the birds put me back together, they gave me this very distinctive face so that I do stand out in a crowd. Uh, trying, trying to find a way to set yourself apart from all the other DJs, all the other producers, all the other, all the other uh, the podcasters even. Like it's, it's all about finding something that doesn't detract from your actual product, but does set you apart from the rest. 
Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I think one of the things that I, I kind of take a little pride on is the amount of episodes and the amount of content that we produce that's coming out because it's kind of like, what does set the DJ session? You're right. I, I'd like that. What is going to set you apart from the rest? You know, I think the, the biggest asset that we have is my tenacity to want to just keep getting more and more and more and more and more. It's uh, it's <laughs> what know? we we used to call in many, many Many, many, many parent teacher conferences over the years, an attention getting device. <laughs> yeah. And as for me, I have two of them. This, this wonderful face that the birds have graced me with and this piece of eighties throwback hardware that, uh, <laughs> I love this turns guitar. heads. That's the thing is like, at, like, uh, like I've played a lot of furry conventions for obvious reasons. I'm a giant robotic man bird, but the thing is like, this doesn't set me apart at furry conventions. This is just sort of like normal. I mean, everywhere else, when I go to a nightclub, they're like, that, that's amazing. They, they love the face. At, at furry conventions or at sci-fi conventions, it's just sort of like, well, everybody has stuff like this. This is the attention-getting device there. And uh, mwah, love, love this it. piece I of hardware. It. So hey, man, good. I, I got a couple more questions for you before I let you get back. Uh, get, get you let, uh, flying out of the bird's nest. Um, if you could score a Hollywood movie, which director would have your preference? Oh man, a Hollywood movie? I, you know, back in the day, I would have said Joss Whedon, but apparently he's a dick. So, uh, <laughs> not sure where to go. I mean, Tim Gunn. Uh, okay. it, it absolutely. Wait, did I get that right? No, Tim. Tim. Wait, no, not Tim Gunn. Uh, James. No, what, James Gunn. The guy, say what? The guy who did uh, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Yeah, Gunn, James, James. James Gunn, thank you, because Tim Gunn's the guy from Project Runway, and fuck it, if he's making a movie, I'd absolutely do that, too. Uh, and he can critique this jacket and this t-shirt all he wants. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, 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 like, there's a there's somebody... It, it, oh, no, actually, I take that back. Taika fucking Watiti. Because... whole, I mean, like, Thor Ragnarok, What We Do in the Shadows, uh, Our Flag Means Death... Absolutely brilliant, this person. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, absolutely, I love the, the blend of quirky, serious, and actually trying to say something meaningful to society at the same time. It's like you have drama, you have, you have comedy, and it doesn't feel like they're shoehorned into each other. I would kill to do something for him. But unfortunately, uh, it seems like Mark Mothersbaugh does the score for any movie he's involved in. So, <laughs> You know, Devo beat me to it. There you go. And what would be, if you could have a, a dream project, something you'd have thought about working on, thought about putting together, but but just haven't yet, or it's in the works, what would your dream project look like? Uh, I would have to say something akin to, uh, I mean, any given Circle video. If you're not familiar with Circle... <laughs> Uh, yeah, C E R C L E. They go to gorgeous locations, and I don't mean like, oh, here's like a mountain backdrop, or here's a, <laughs> a here's like a, a pretty piece of shoreline. They go to an actual like precipice on the edge of a cliff. They go to Pitts Gloria. You know, they go to the the Great Pyramids. Like, uh, it's they they pick these stupendously unique visual locations and have a deep or progressive uh, producer do their thing for anywhere from like an hour to two hours. I would love to do something like that. And I have a local friend who wants to do something exactly like that with the album that I'm working on. So hopefully I'll have some stupendous news sometime in the next year, but we live in a very beautiful part of the world, don't we, Darren? We do. Like, we do. Definitely. We got mountains. We got glaciers. We have deserts. We have the ocean. <laughs> we have Spokane, but who's counting? We have all these. I graduated from, from, I graduated in Spokane twice. I can, I can shit on Spokane a little bit. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, the, <laughs> the thing is like, there's so many good places to do a mind blowingly beautiful video like that. And I'm very blessed to have friends who are, uh, talented at video production and want to help me out with it. They have drones, they have generators, they have, you know, lighting and uh, uh, photography know-how, they have editing and technical skills, and they're willing to use them 
for whatever I come up with for this album. So I need to actually finish this damn thing before they get before they forget who I am. But I that is my ultimate goal, to be honest, is to have some some beautiful work like that uh, tied to one of my creations, tied to an album, you know? So it's it's something that can... I want to be able to facilitate people leaving this reality if only for an hour or two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that something like that could make it happen. I want them to think about more. More than what they are. More than the walls around them more than the the hand that they've been dealt. If I can help spark a little bit of imagination and show them something that broadens their horizons, I I could die a happy bird. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to let our DJ Sessions fans know before we let you get going? Come watch me on Twitch. I mean, that's, that's about it, honestly. Um, and stay positive. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I I, I try to convey specifically is you will find what you're looking for. So if you're looking for evil in people, you will find evil people. If you look for the light in others, you will find that light and it's not easy and it doesn't come naturally. You have to train yourself and eventually that will be the first thing you see is the good in someone else and it will change your life when you start seeing people this way. So Give it a shot. Give somebody the benefit of the doubt when you normally wouldn't have. I mean, you know, be cautious. Keep your hand on your wallet. But, you know, at the same time, try looking for the light. Actually, if you, even if you have to squint, look for it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's some great advice. And where can people find you on Twitch? We'll drop uh, those links. All you have to do is go to avianinvasion.com and you will find me anywhere. Look for Avian Invasion on literally any service. Uh, I am not hard to find. It's twitch.tv slash avianinvasion, YouTube slash, you know, avianinvasion, or just join me at avianinvasion.com. If you join the mailing list, you'll get a free album from me. So even if you if you're not sure you like what you're hearing, all you, you can always unsubscribe, <laughs> but you get something for free for me. So hopefully I'll see awesome. you there. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show this evening. We know there's so much more coming down the pipeline from you out of the bird's nest, not a fledging bird anymore. It's actually left the nest. It's going to leave the nest. It's out there. Haven invasion resident DJ on the DJ sessions. Thank you so much for coming on tonight and talking with us. Thank you so much, Darren. I appreciate it. You're welcome. On that note, don't forget to go to our website, thedjsessions.com. Check out all our residents. Find us on TikTok. Find us on Instagram. Find us on Twitter. Find us on Facebook, The DJ Sessions. And check out this guy streaming three times a week. Album releases, everything coming out. He has a beautiful resident page on the site, Avian Invasion. And Darren Bruce for The DJ Sessions presents the virtual sessions. And you know what happens on The DJ Sessions. The music never stops.